In generations past, people believed in God and the supernatural because they didn't understand the world. Yet, with the invention of microscopes and telescopes, leading to an explosion in scientific knowledge, belief in God became unnecessary, more so told. But our faith in science really at all? Join us to discover if physics and biology, cosmology and evolution are enemies of faith, or if they are actually allies. God and Science, a series at Stapleton Church. Is, is anybody excited for that series? Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad you guys are excited. Um, my name is Matt Wolf. I'm the lead pastor here, and we at Stapleton Church are all about helping people follow Jesus. And with that, we are welcoming in nine new members into our church, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, um, that's, that's great. And we have four people at that class said, hey, I want to publicly declare my faith through getting baptized. So we're going to have four people plus a few others it's coming up here in soon. If you want to make that decision and say, hey, I could go public with my faith, that baptism is for you. That's what it is, telling the world that you believe in Jesus. Um, so that's exciting. Another thing going on in our church is our Raise the Roof project. Raise the Roof, right? Yep. Okay, let's see those hands. Raise the Roof, because this historic Hangar 61, which is an incredible building, some of the roof uh, concrete is starting to crumble. We need to fix it. Um, and... I just wanted to say, hey, to continue to give to this, but already in just about a month, you guys have given over $50,000 for this project. So thank you guys so much. But please don't stop. If you haven't given a gift yet, please prayerfully consider that or, or give a monthly gift because we are, need to raise quite a bit more money. We Don't stop right now. We've still got a lot of, to go before we have enough money to fix this for generations to come so that more people can follow Jesus here in this building. Um, one other thing, we just finished last week our Belong series. Wasn't that a good series? Yeah, I hope that you guys liked it. If you missed any of those messages, go to stapletonchurch.com under the media tab. We keep all the audio and video of every single message. Catch up on that because we were in this day and age where we've never been more connected, yet we've never felt more alone. And I thought about it a lot this week because um, uh, in the very first message of that series, I gave, told this survey about how 30 years ago... If people were asked, how many people could you call in the middle of the night if you had an emergency? People said five. I have five people that would come and help me. Today, that's a big whopping zero on a survey. People say, I don't have anyone to call on average. And this week, I kind of had an emergency because I was cutting some apples and sliced off my fingertip. And as I was, it wasn't very deep, but it was a lot of blood. Um, and as I was bleeding and bleeding and bleeding, couldn't stop the bleeding, I thought, huh, I need some community for my church. So I called up Chad Smith in our church, a friend, and he's on our safety team. I, I just saw him walking around up here. And yeah, there he is. Hey, Chad. Um, Chad came over because he was an army medic. And I was like, I need a medic to, to dress this battle wound. He came over, fixed me up. So hopefully I can keep the finger, right? But thank you, Chad. We need community, right? And you shouldn't wait till you're bleeding out. So that's why we choose community here, and we focus on relationships. We try to take people out. If you know people here, hey, let's get to coffee, let's get dinner. I heard some good stories about that over the last few weeks. Get to know some people. We need it. Okay, that was last week's series that we finished up. This week's is God and Science, and I think we're all ready for this series. This is going to be a good series because it seems like there is a war going on between faith and science in our world, this war going on, this conflict. And I felt it growing up. So I grew up in Colorado Springs, which you may or may not know is the evangelical Mecca. Um, I don't know if you knew that. Everybody goes to Colorado Springs to focus on the family and all those other nonprofits. But I grew up there, and for a time during my formative years, we went to a very conservative, I'd say even fundamentalist church. And if any of you guys grew up in a background like that, I remember very vividly in my formative years being taught very assertively that the, the Bible teaches that the earth is only created in six days and the age of the earth is 6,000 years, period. If you read anything or hear anything otherwise, it's wrong. And, and on top of that, we were told that evolution is from the devil and anyone who's teaching that is teaching the, the devil's work and therefore you need to be wary because there are scientists out there who are trying to take away your faith. And these fears that I had as a teenager being taught this were uh, brought to light on my very first day of high school. I remember this vividly. My first class, first period of freshman year of high school, I walk in on the first day to biology class, and there's Dr. Scott. Now, Dr. Scott is an amazing, brilliant woman. I had her twice in high school. 
She had a PhD at the time, teaching high school, right? But she went on to work for a crime scene lab, and she was just in the news recently because she helped in one of those big cases. She found the DNA that connected a cold case through like 23andMe or one of those online and, and found a cold case killer through that, which is amazing. This brilliant woman. But I remember on the first day, first period biology class, freshman year, she said, we are going to study and learn about evolutionary biology in this class. You will study it. You will learn it. You will know it. It will be on the test. And if you, don't, if you disagree with it or you're a creationist, I don't want to hear it. We're not going to waste one minute of class talking about it. I was like, oh, I guess they were right. These teachers and professors are out there to steal my faith from me, right? This is kind of what I grew up in. And it went more than that because I remember learning in history class about how Galileo was tortured and imprisoned because of what he taught by the church. And then I remember in literature class learning about the Scopes Monkey Trial. Do you remember that? Learned about it through Inherit the Wind? Because this is another historical thing in our country where there was a substitute teacher in Tennessee who was teaching about evolutionary biology and he was put on trial. And none other than William Jennings Bryan, a three-time presidential candidate, steps out of politics to prosecute him, right? This is a major national story because now uh, it's faith and science. They're at war with each other. There's this great conflict. And it seems like what I learned even going on through high school and into college is that the, the attitude that our country has today is that science has advanced to a point, as you saw in the video, that we know so much, we have discovered so much that God is unnecessary, Faith is just superstitious, old-fashioned belief. People used to believe in it, but we know so much more now, we don't need it anymore. If you're drinking it, that's the flavor of Kool-Aid that our culture is drinking, right? And it's not just on the popular level. You watch some YouTube videos, this is what it's going to say. When you talk to your friends in class or in college, that's what they're going to say, but it's professors too. Um, I have some quotes, one from Steven Pinker, who is a Harvard psychologist, he says that the findings of science imply that the belief systems of all the world's traditional religions and cultures are factually mistaken. It's more than just him. Stephen Hawking, the great physicist, said, We are each free to believe what we want, and it is my view that the simplest explanation is that there is no God, no one created the universe, and no one directs our fate. It's fine to believe whatever you want, but you're wrong. That's what he's saying. But it gets even harsher than that. Richard Dawkins said that faith is a form of mental illness, a great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Shots fired. This is a war going on, right? Not only from faith saying that science is wrong, don't listen to those scientists, don't listen to your professors at school, and the scientists saying, hey, faith, that, they got it all wrong, don't listen, especially to those Christians. There's this caricature of Christianity today in our society that all Christians uh, are science-hating, flat-earth-believing, uh, homeschoolers too afraid of public school who make their own clothes. <laughs> That's the caricature of us, and it may or may not be true. Some of you make your own clothes. I don't know. But it's just a caricature. And it can go the other way, too. There's this caricature that every scientist and every professor in every university is out there to destroy your child's faith. There's this great conspiracy to disrupt Christianity. And both sides are caricatures, right? And I think it's time to move past that. Because the reality is this war uh, between science and religion is way overblown and really kind of a modern fabrication and yet people believe that it exists. And on top of that, we need to move past those caricatures. Because yes, there are some Christians who are like that. Those, you know, fundy and they're funny undies. You know what I'm talking about. Those fundamentalists. I went to one of those churches. So you, there are those people. There are the six day, and, and some of you are those people. But that actually might be the minority view today in our world. There, there are a lot of Christians that hold different views about science than just that traditional way of thinking. And on the other hand, there are many scientists who are believers. You'd be amazed. And in fact, in this series, one of the cool things that we're going to do is have different people in scientific fields in our church 
that are going to do some videos. We're going to show a video each week, and then those people are going to come back for the night service where we're going to do a Q&A at the end of the night service, so you guys can come back for that. This is going to be interesting because those characters are, caricatures are wrong. We need to move past that and realize that science and faith should never be at war. They should never be at war. So, this series, um, God willing, or if you're not a believer, because I know some of you are here, then you're not, Chance, if, if Chance has it, uh, we're going to have five series, right? We're going to have five messages in this series. That's my goal. My wife's pregnant with twins. We're 32 weeks pregnant. So if something happens, then we may change things around. So just be flexible with us. Is that okay? Whether it's fate or God that intervenes. But either way, we're going to try to have five weeks in this series. And today, this is an overview message. This is kind of an introduction to the whole series. It's so foundational to all the things we're going to talk, talk about. But we're not going to get into a ton of details today. If you're saying, hey, Matt, I want more. I need more. You're leaving some things hanging. I have some questions. Well, for one, you can text in your questions, and we can cover them at our Q&As. We have this slide up here. You can text those in. And two, you need to come back. Okay, one message is not going to do it in this series. There's no way I could cover all this ground. I'm not even going to be able to cover everything in five messages. But I want you guys to commit to this. Whether you're a believer or not, or, or, or whatever, I want you to commit to these five messages. If you miss one, if you're like, ah, oh, Matt, I'm out of town, watch online. We have the live stream on Facebook. We have audio and video on our website. And you can text in questions if you want to go further. So that's what we're going to do in our series, this five-week series, because God and science are not at war. Now, there's been a step from that, that, okay, there was this conflict, God at war. And back in the 80s and 90s, really some people were saying, hey, this is not good. This war that's going on, because it does feel that way. I, I felt it growing up. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. feels like there's this attack, whether it's towards science or towards faith. And people try to move past it. And one of the, the people that was really leading the charge was an evolutionary biologist professor at um, Harvard. And he's saying, hey, we're having some issues with this. And I'm going to look up his name, because there's a lot of names for today. Remembered at first service. Um, but uh, he, he's saying, hey, this used to be called um, that there's this fight, Stephen Jay Gould. And he said, hey, but, but it doesn't need to be at war. He said there's a thing called non-overlapping magisteria. Fancy term, right? What he's saying is that you can have faith over here and believe what you want. And then you can study science over here and see where the evidence leads. And they're non-overlapping. You can be a person of faith and a person of science. Well, this is a great step in the right direction. Okay, we don't have to be at war. We don't have to be at conflict. You can study your faith and grow, but you can also study science and learn as much as you can. They don't have to overlap at all, Stephen Jay Gould said, and a lot of people have followed him. But I don't think that's good enough. I don't think that's good enough, and I don't think it's ever supposed to be that way because here's the problem. They do overlap. You read Genesis 1, and you're like, huh, that's a little bit different. It seems like it's different than what I was taught about geology and the history of the world. I hear about Noah's flood. How does that fit with paleontology and archaeology? How does that work? And they seem to overlap. Or you read things in the Bible or, or hear things in science, and it seems like they're in conflict. What's going on here? Well, here's the thing. Science and faith are supposed to work together. They're supposed to be together. And I am going to argue today that not only are they not enemies, they are actually allies that reinforce each other. They are allies that reinforce each other. So I hope that you guys will have an open mind. That's what we're doing, right? We're, even for those of you who, who in here is like a really scientific person, loves science, studies it all the time. Okay, we got, we got a few. It's okay. We're not going to, we're not, I just said we're not at war. You can raise your hand. <laughs> if you're a scientific person, that's awesome. I love it. And, and we should come, all of us, with an open mind, right? We want to learn. Here's the thing. Did you know that Jesus taught us to love the Lord your God, not just with all your heart, but with all your mind? That means if you actually love God, you should think. You're not loving God if you're not thinking hard. Hmm, interesting, right? You're going to be thinking a lot in this series. You should be thinking. You should be studying. Those of you who are in school right now, whether in, in elementary, middle school, high school, college, if you're studying, you should think, and you should think hard. You should evaluate, because maybe we need to just study and think more. God commands you through Jesus to think, to love the Lord your God with all of your mind. Because 
what we need to start out, we're, we're going to talk about science first, and then we're going to talk about faith. So if you're the scientific person and you're saying here, maybe you're not a believer, or you're not sure, or you're an agnostic, wherever you are, if you're here, I'm going to talk to you first, those scientific people. Whoa. Because we need to be a little more humble about our science. Because science cannot answer everything. It can't. Science cannot. Uh, very simplistically, science asks, a- answers the question, how? But it cannot answer the question, why? Science tells us how the world works, how we be- came to be, perhaps. It, it tells us how about a lot of different things, but it doesn't tell us why. And I read a, a book by an evolutionary uh, biologist, atheist, and he was saying, hey, when we're looking at the history of humankind, this is what this book was about, you look at it and how we adapted and, and evolved, you want to ask the question why, and I'm paraphrasing him a little bit, but this is pretty much what he said. You might want to ask the question why, but the more important question is how, and that's what we're going to focus on in this book, and then moves on from the why, never to address it again. But why does he get to decide that why is not important? Why is a very important question. How is good? We can uh, measure things. We can observe things. We can run experiments. We can have hypotheses and test them. There's a great deal we can learn from the question how. But the question of why is pretty important too. Think about it with a crime. Okay? I just want you to picture for a second. You walk into a room and there is a woman, a wife, who has been murdered. A crime scene you're coming up to. We love CSI, NCIS. There's eight billion forms of those from every city in the country, right? We, we watch those shows because we're interested, trying to figure out who done it, right? And you come across this crime scene. We know, scientifically, you can figure out how this person was killed. You look at the blood spatter. A lot of blood today we're talking about. There's some blood splatter. You can measure it and figure out the trajectory from where this person was when they were uh, perhaps attacked. And, and you can take DNA from different samples on the person under the fingernails of this woman, and you can kind of figure things out. And from science, you can figure out that it was her husband who did it. Lieutenant, or I'm sorry, Colonel Mustard, not Lieutenant, Colonel Mustard (laughs) in the observatory with the candlestick. Or, more scientifically speaking, was blunt force trauma at the base of the skull that led to a subdermal hematoma. Right? Scientifically, we know how it happened. We even know who did it, right? He did it because we can match the DNA on his shoes to the dead woman, right? We know that he did it. His fingerprints are on the candlestick. We know how, we know who, but you know what science cannot tell us? Why? Why did he do it? And you may say that's not an important question. We figured out who done it. That's the only thing that matters. But it matters if you're their daughter and you're trying to figure out why did my dad murder my mom in the observatory? Why did that happen to me? Or if you're serving on the jury and you're trying to figure out why did this person, was it self-defense? Was it self-defense and we should let the guy off? Or was it premeditated and we should put him in prison or perhaps execute him? Those are major decisions. And you're asking the question why and science cannot answer that. Or if you're part of society and you're just like, I want to make sure that these kind of spousal murders don't happen anymore. We got to figure out why so that we can prevent them from happening in the future. The question of why is very important, and that question moves us beyond the realm of those hard sciences to the realm of maybe the softer sciences, sociology, psychology, or even beyond that. Why does it even matter that he murdered his wife? Scientifically speaking, it was just survival of the fittest. Who cares? Now we're moving into ethics and morality and maybe theology. Okay, Science cannot answer every question certainly can't ever answer the question of why, and I believe that that's a very important question. On top of that, science as we know it is best when it is, because there's multiple types of science, but there's this type of science we call observational science, or experiential science, or operational science, that we can test and measure things. But when we're talking about the past, well, we can't test it, we can't observe it. We're taking maybe hypotheses, which is a fancy word for a guess about what happened, can be a very, very educated guess, but we don't know for sure because we weren't there. And we're just talking about something that maybe happened a day ago, let alone 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years, 14 billion years ago. That's a lot of guesswork. Might be very, very educated guess, but we don't know for sure because we weren't there. We're talking in the realm of history now. 
which is a little, it's a type of science, but it's not as pure of a science as we think it is. So when we look at that, we should be humble. Those of us who are scientifically minded, we should be humble and realize, hey, science cannot answer every question about the world. I think this is highlighted pretty well by Alan Sandage, who's considered the greatest evolutionary, I'm sorry, uh, I, are we good? Sorry, the Kraken, I don't know what that is. The, the greatest observational cosmologist in our country. Alan Sandage wrote, It is my science that drove me to the conclusion that the world is much more complicated than can be explained by science. There's a lot of questions left unanswered. And on top of that, we don't know everything, do we? We don't know everything. I want to... This is interesting, because I, I want to show you this quote from a Nobel Prize-winning physicist. He said, The more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered, and these are now so firmly established that the possibility of their ever being supplanted in consequence of new discoveries is exceedingly remote. Our future discoveries must be looked for in the sixth place of decimals. Saying you don't need to study physics anymore, we've got it all figured out. That's a lot of arrogance, isn't it? Sometimes you run into this. Uh, I've interviewed a lot of scientists, talked with them. Usually most of them are very humble. And we need to be because this was actually given at a speech just a few years before Albert Einstein discovered the idea of relativity, which blew up everything we thought we knew about physics. And then it was even a few years after that where Max Planck, the German physicist, discovered quantum mechanics. And everything we knew was not even close to enough, <laughs> enough six place of decimals. It's laughable now, right? And, and we have a chronological snobbery. We have a chronological snobbery that we think, oh, people in the past were so ignorant and dumb, we've discovered so much more and we know so much more today. Well, do you know what they're going to be saying 10, 15, 20 years from now? The exact same thing. We do not have everything figured out. Even today, we're discovering more and more and more about everything in our universe. There's so much still to be learned about microbiology and about the cosmos. We're just scratching the surface. So let's take a very humble approach and say, science cannot answer all the questions, and even the ones it can, we don't have all the answers yet. So if we start there with a, a, a spirit of humility, I think it's going to help us approach this entire subject a little better. So if you're that science person, let's, let's be a little humble. But now let's talk to the faith people, because we need to do the same. We need to do the same. Because God wants us to study science. Did you know that? I want to show you this from Psalm 19. Psalm 19 this was written by David, the great king of Israel, some 3,000 years ago. And he begins Psalm 19 by saying, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal what? Knowledge. The universe, the sky, the stars, you look all around us, David is saying, and it's teaching us something. It's teaching us actually about God. But I think it's so fascinating that the very last word in verse 2 is knowledge. Because that word knowledge, in the Latin Bible, which for the majority of the Christian church's history, our Bible was in Latin, it was translated here from the Hebrew. But do you know what that Hebrew word knowledge is in Latin? Anybody? Scientia from which we derive the English word science. I think that this verse is telling us to study and get more knowledge because the word knowledge is science. Science means knowledge. We're supposed to study. And, and the universe is declaring that there's all this knowledge to be had, this science that's out there. We should discover it and learn it. It's talking. Listen. Because it's telling us about God. See, God himself, through the poet David, is saying, you need to study and learn and study the world around you and learn more knowledge, learn more science, because it's actually pointing even deeper to God and faith. Fascinating, right? Fascinating, right? I think we need to change because 
There is no indication here of a war between God and science. Instead, God is saying, do science. (laughs) Study, learn. You don't know enough yet. God wants us to further learn knowledge about the universe around us. Doesn't sound like a war to me. This is continued on in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, Paul writes, Ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through the things God has made. We should be studying the universe because it actually tells us more about the God of the universe. Fascinating, right? I think we need to reshape our mind, those of us who are coming from a Christian perspective. God is actually telling us to study more, to learn more about knowledge. Back in the French Revolution, as the story goes, there was um, some revolutionaries, and back then they were, they were the atheistic revolutionaries in the French Revolution, and they were going around and they were taking down cathedrals and they were yelling at some peasants, we're going to take down your steeples so that we can, uh, we're going to pull them down so that we can remove any vestige, any amount of the superstitious religion that you've been holding for centuries. It's time to move past that. To which the peasant, hearing it, replied, but you cannot pull down the stars. See, um, Annie Dillard, the poet, once said that a cathedral and a laboratory are both saying the same thing. Hello. I believe that the universe around us, as we're taught in God's word, is telling us about God. And we should study it. We should seek to know more and understand it better because it actually is not going to take us away from faith and ruin your faith or take away the faith of your children. It should actually drive them to deeper faith in God. I think this is the reason why it was Christian Europe not Muslim uh, Middle East or China, which at the time were pretty much equivalent historically, but it was Christian Europe where the scientific revolution began. And it's the reason why some of the greatest um, scientists our world has ever known claim faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we talked earlier about Galileo, but it turns out he was a Christian. He actually probably wrote more about faith than about science. You study his works. Or, or other people like Sir Isaac Newton. There's so many Christians in the scientific revolution. In fact, it was what drove them to study the world because they understood what Psalm 19 was teaching us. It's why Gregory Mendel, you know, the father of modern genetics, literally was a monk in service to God. I don't know if you knew that. It's why Louis Pasteur, the, the great chemist who discovered the pasteurization process, He said that he would pray as he worked in his lab. Even people who are not Christians today, like the physicist Paul Davies, conclude, it may seem bizarre, but in my opinion, science offers a surer path to God than religion. As these scientists are studying the book of nature, looking all around them, they're reading about God and how he created the universe. It is true that in uh, the hard sciences, 34% of science professors at elite universities claim there is no God, 34%, which is a pretty high percentage. But it's also true that among those hard scientists, 51% of scientists, according to one poll, claim that they believe in some form of God. That's a majority. (laughs) Might just be a little bit over majority, but the majority of hard science professors in our country claim that there is some kind of God out there. I don't hear that in the news. I thought there's this war going on. Sure, but there's so many people who aren't even fighting at all. Because science and faith don't need to be at war at all. They can work together and be allies and actually reinforce each other. I think of uh, Francis Collins. He has a great book called The Language of God. And if you look here on your bulletin on the very back side of it, each week we're going to give you a few resources because I know some of you love this stuff and you want to dig further. So there's an article, there's an event coming up this week. It's actually about biology. Um, there are number three at Mission Hills, Michael Behe. Um, but there's a video that you can watch and um, there's a book that you can read. The very last one is a book, The Language of God 
the scientist prevent, presents evidence for belief by Francis Collins. Now, Francis Collins, he shares his story in the book, and he actually was an agnostic for a while, meaning he didn't know. That he said there's not enough evidence, and then he actually became an atheist, saying there is no God. But then the more he worked in his scientific field, first he was an MD, and then he got his PhD in genetics. Brilliant guy, right? And he actually came to faith in Jesus Christ. And he was the um, geneticist who led the Human Genome Project and completed it, which took a long time at first. Now we can do it pretty quickly. But to map that genome, because there are three billion base pairs, three billion, that's a B, right, uh, of DNA. That, those are those letters, that, you know, I don't even remember what they are from Dr. Scott's class. Sorry, Dr. Scott. A, G, T, C? something like that, that fit together those pairs, three billion of them, in order to make one human genome. And they had finally mapped it out. They could see how it all fits together. And when they looked at it, the president of the United States at the time, Bill Clinton, he gave a speech after this project was completed, because this is a great scientific achievement in most of our lifetimes. Sorry, Gen Zers. But for most of our lifetimes, this happened. And as Bill Clinton was talking about it, he says, we have now glimpsed the language of God. And Francis Collins went up afterwards and gave his speech describing what they had done. And he said, not only is this a scientific achievement that should be celebrated, it is a time for worship. Because we have seen the instructional book of how God knit us together. See the universe around us, whether it's on a small microscopic scale or the vast universe that we have to use telescopes to look through. It's all declaring the glory of God. Haven't you ever stood on the top of a mountain looking out, or, or stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, or looked up at the night sky and said, there's something way bigger than me out here. There's got to be something bigger. And that sense is from God himself. God is saying, I'm here. The stars are declaring, I'm here. God himself is speaking through all of that. The heavens declare the glory of God. Will you listen? So I want to challenge you, those who are followers of Jesus, if you're believers, pursue scientific knowledge. Learn more, study, grow. We have just begun to scratch the surface for most of the sciences. We should learn, if you're young here, don't be afraid to study science. We need more believers who are saying, I will do this, just like those believers in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Making sure you guys are awake. But here's the thing. God didn't stop there and say, study science, that'll be good. You'll be good to go. Because as we've talked about, science isn't enough. And God himself, through the poet Dan David, would say the same thing. And that's why in verse 7 and 8, we read, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. It's a really interesting psalm, and I encourage you to go back and read through it, because the whole first six verses are all about how the heavens declare the glory of God, and then there's this abrupt stop, and all of a sudden David starts talking about the law. He's not talking about the laws of nature. What is he talking about? The law of God. And at the time, there was only probably the first five books of the Bible written, which are called the Torah, which translates to law. He's saying, if you read the scriptures, it teaches us something. It teaches us something uh, about how God actually wants us to live. It teaches us more about God than we can gather from nature around us. And there's a lot we can gather from studying nature about who God is, that he exists, that he's personal, that he has power, that he interacts with the universe. Those are all things I think that we can draw conclusions from just scientific study. But it's still not enough. Because if there is a God who created us and knit together this entire universe and, and over 14 billion years planned so that we could exist here, and if he cares about us, he probably cares about how we live. Right? And David is saying that is why God has given us a second book, Revelation. He's revealing it. And it's not just five books. It includes these Psalms. It includes the New Testament. It's 66 books that God has given us to reveal a little bit more about him, what he expects of us, and what to do when we go wrong. And it says here very clearly in verse 7 that the law of the Lord is perfect. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. 
saying this book is perfect. It is without flaw. There is nothing wrong with it. It is teaching perfection about God. Just like studying nature, you could learn the perfect reality of the world. No, we don't get it all the time. Same thing with the Bible. We don't get it all the time. But it in itself is perfect. We'll get back to that in just a minute. But the point is we need the scriptures. We need the revealed will of God to us because science is not enough on its own. And what I believe that this psalm is teaching us, why it has these two things back to back with not even like a, there's no transition at all in this passage. It just goes from science to the Bible, right? There's no transition at all. And why are those back to back? Because we need both books. There are two books and we need to know the one author. That's what I believe David is teaching us, God is teaching us, and I want you to leave here today that there are two books in the world, and both of them are teaching us about the one God, the one author of it all. That the God who created the cosmos is the same God who spoke through prophets, through the man Jesus Christ, through this poet David as he wrote this beautiful psalm about the world. God is speaking to us if we would care to listen. But there are two books he's written, and both of them are written by the same author, meaning they mean the same thing, and they do not contradict each other. They do not contradict each other. I was trying to think of a good analogy for this, and it's not perfect, but one of my favorite authors is C.S. Lewis. I've tried to read almost everything he's written. He's brilliant. And he wrote two books on the subject of pain and suffering. And it's very fascinating because the first book he wrote was early on in his life, and it's called The Problem of Pain. Great book. He approaches this idea of suffering very philosophically, and he looks at it and says, hey, this can fit together with faith in God, that God can be the God of the universe who cares about us and allow suffering to happen, and here's how. Great book. I recommend it. But then years later, he fell in love with a woman, and within just a few years after them getting married, she was dying of cancer. And through that process, he wrote a second book, um, and the second book was called A Grief Observed, about suffering again. But if you read those books, they're completely, vastly different because one is theoretical and one is experiential, right? And even though it's the same author, you can read and learn so much about who C.S. Lewis was through those two books. You can learn so much about what he was teaching and what he thought. But both books together form a much better picture of the reality of who he was. And I think in a similar way, we need both books about God. God gave us nature to study, that book of nature. And he gave us the book that we call the Bible so that we could study him as well. And both books fit together. This concept of the two books actually goes back centuries. Maybe the first person who coined the phrase the two books was Thomas Aquinas, a great Christian philosopher. He says, hey, look, there are these two books that God has written, and we need to study them. But this actually has been continued on by many scientists over and over throughout the years. For example, um, Michael Faraday, brilliant physicist, studied electromagnetism. He said that the book of nature, which we have to read, is written by the finger of God. Or maybe Johannes um, Kepler said, we astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature. They were understanding this concept. They say, we are the ones who are studying this in depth. We have the pastors who are studying the Bible for that book. And we need both. So these guys are saying, we need both. And we need to understand that because here's the thing. They never contradict. Well, Matt, what about Genesis chapter 1? What about the flood? How does that fit in? Is the earth 6,000 years old or is it 4.5 billion years old? Which is it, Matt? It seems to contradict the Bible. Here's the thing. If you ever run into these things, and you will, that seem like contradictions, there's a few things that could be going on. It could be that you have interpreted the Bible wrong. You're reading it not the way it should, not the way that God intended it. The second option is you're reading the scientific evidence wrong. Did you know that happens too? Scientists requ requires interpretation. You, you, when you study things, you have to interpret the data. It's literally what they call it, interpreting the data. You could have interpreted the data wrong. Or the third option, you've interpreted both wrong. Okay? So let's be humble and say when we run into those contradictions, it's not actually a contradiction because it's the same author who wrote both books. The problem is probably within ourselves. And I think this can be interested well with that story of Galileo. 
It turns out he actually wasn't tortured by the church, but he was put on trial and put under house arrest for, for what he was teaching about how it turns out, okay, the earth is not the center of the universe. The sun does not revolve around the earth. It's actually the other way around. And what was wrong was not the Bible because the Bible never anywhere teaches that the, the sun revolves around the earth. It doesn't. However, the Greeks taught that. And that had been carried on for generations and generations and then kind of been subsumed into the way people were interpreting the Bible. So it's not the interpret that the it's I'm sorry, not the Bible that's wrong, it's the interpretation of the Bible that was wrong, right? But it can also be the exact opposite, that sometimes the Bible has it wrong, right, and science is interpreted wrong. And I'm going to talk about one of those instances next week, so you better come back. Here's the thing. I think we need to do what Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, encouraged us to do. He is the wisest who reads both the world book and the word book as two volumes of the same work and feels concerning them, my father wrote them So read the books, study them, learn, grow. I hope this series you will learn a lot through the next several weeks because we need both books because both books are pointing us to the one author. I said we were going to have some videos in this series, so we're going to watch our first video interview from one of our individuals in our church who's in a scientific field. Let's just watch this video. Uh, My name is Ryan Peterson. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of biostatistics at uh, CU Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, I got into biostatistics and I guess specifically statistics because I thought um, that statistics is a really, really good way to learn more about our natural world. Uh, At least it is like 95% of the time. Yeah, so what a biostatistician does is we help the researchers in, who are uh, experts in like pulmo- pulmonary sciences or medical sciences of various types, and we often help them uh, come up, or at least figure out what, which treatments work and which treatments don't. There's a lot of math that goes into how we determine what works and what doesn't, and so we help out with that. I actually often like to call the field uh, the study of uncertainty, and uh, so my field is essentially uncertainty science. And so I thought a lot about uncertainty and what it means to believe in something uh, and, and how all of our beliefs, you know, it, th- just because we believe in something doesn't necessarily make it true. Uh, that, and most of the beliefs that we have are actually really arbitrary, uh, but some of them are very core. And so I think there was a time when I struggled with the idea of uncertainty when it comes to like very core beliefs to Christianity and to, about God. Um, but I think through a lot of uh, just deep thought about it, I think so- what science can do, uh, what, what it's capable of is very different than what, um, what faith can do and what faith is capable of. D- so I think the biggest impact that I can think of in philosophy was probably St. Thomas Aquinas' idea of uh, natural revelation compared to divine revelation. Uh, Divine revelation is the knowledge that God has revealed to us through prophets and apostles um, and through our everyday life relationship with him. Um, The natural revelation is the things that we learn about uh, just by being here, just by being in the world. And I think science itself is a fantastic tool for natural revelation. Uh, It's led to amazing technological and scientific discoveries. discoveries over the years. It's the reason we can cure a lot of diseases and we don't have a lot of diseases now. And it's a tool really given to us by God to learn more about our world. I would say that faith and science are definitely compatible. Even if you, you know, don't think uh, the Bible is true or if you don't think God exists, you, you are going to be basing your beliefs on some model of thought. And you might think that that is a scientifically based one, but no science, science will ever be able to prove a, any scientific theory true. Uh, all, all science can really do is prove one's false. So I, I think it was Einstein who said that no amount of experimentation will ever prove my theories correct. One experiment can prove them wrong. And so science in general is very good at um, proving models wrong, but it's, it's never going to actually get you to, a lot of, to answer a lot of life's questions.